Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael weiss -Malik. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, John Bailey is with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and he's done a ton of work to do uh, outreach using KML and Google Earth and the geosciences, and he's here to show us some of his work. So please welcome John Bailey. As Michael said, I'm from the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. I actually have sort of multiple affiliations there. I'll, I'll get into exactly what I do and for whom in a second. Um, but basically, I'm a volcanologist. And amongst the things I do is I use Google Earth as a tool for looking at volcanoes, put quite simply. The uh, things I'm going to show here today uh, I really can't claim to be all my own work. There's a whole bunch of people involved in this. Um, and we all sort of have our various roles. Uh, Ken Dean, John Dean are sort of the, the faculty in charge of our group that oversee things. Um, Lovro, Ray, uh, our main technicians. Peter Webley is a fellow postdoc that's done some great work with ash plumes that we'll, we'll see today. And then uh, Walter and William are our little undergraduate helpers that um, just have skills that blow us all the way. Uh, my general role is sort of uh, for KML visualization, under or pretending to understand KML. And if they want a pretty picture made, they usually come to me. So. My background is I grew up in England, a place called Ellsbury in Buckinghamshire. I uh, went and did my undergraduate at the University of Kent at Canterbury. I was studying physics and space science. I basically wanted to be an astronaut, but uh, soon came to the realization that, that probably wasn't going to happen. So I decided to go for a uh, safer and more normal course of career and became a volcanologist. So in 1998, I moved to Hawaii, where I did uh, a master's and a PhD in, uh, well, in geology, geophysics, but specializing in physical volcanology. And then as a consequence of meeting a man up the top of a volcano in Italy, a few years later, I found myself in Alaska, where I am officially a postdoc with the Alaska Volcano Observatory, although I'm employed by the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center, and I also moonlight teaching for the geography department. So what I'm going to do now is just uh, introduce the Alaska Volcano Observatory to you, introduce specifically my group within that, which is the Remote Sensing Group, and give you an overview of our activities as a way of setting the context for what we're doing, well, specifically with Google Earth. So the Alaska Volcano Observatory is a three-part collaboration um, between these organizations, the Geophysical Institute at the University of Alaska, in Fairbanks, the Alaska State Survey, which is also based in Fairbanks, and the US Geological Survey, which is based in Anchorage. It was formed in uh, 1988 as a consequence of the 86 eruption of Augustine, but its real growth happened in 1989 as a consequence of something happened during the, 1980, uh, during the eruption of Redoubt Volcano. Now, some, some people will say, well, why do you even need a volcano observatory in Alaska? You know, no one lives there. It's OK, a volcano erupts, it upsets a few bears. Who's worried? Well, in 1989, a KLM flight flying from Amsterdam into Anchorage, uh, a 747 carrying 231 passengers, was, uh, was about 20 minutes outside of Anchorage when it encountered the fringes of an ash plume that had come out from Redoubt Volcano. Now. What the pilot did can't be blamed, but what they're taught when they come into bad weather or used to be taught was, you know, they will throttle up and try and get over the, the, the bad weather. But in this case, going through those actions meant that uh, she ended up ingesting large amounts of ash into the engines. Ash is effectively just silicates. You combine that with the heat of the engines, you freeze them. You form a glass casing. And this is what happened to this, this plane. All four engines froze. In the space of about four minutes, they fell from uh, nearly 28,000 feet to about 13,000 feet. They finally managed to get their engines restarted. 
they all landed safely at Anchorage, everyone got their baggage. Doesn't even usually happen on most flights. But, but the moral of the story there was that, you know, this plane encountered a Nash cloud and a tragic event could have happened. And this whole region that we're dealing with has about 200,000 passengers and a billion dollars of freight flying over it each year. Oh, sorry, each, each day. And so, you know, we need to know what's going on with the volcanoes, of which there are many. There are approximately about 70 volcanoes across Alaska and the Aleutians. If you include the whole of the North Pacific, by which I mean the Cascade Range and Kamchatka as well, you're looking at about 100 potentially active volcanoes. And of these, many are monitored by ground instruments. AVO has sort of four main areas which they, they work in. Seismology, geodesy, um, geology, and remote sensing. And we, our mission involves monitoring these volcanoes for activity, doing assessments of potential hazards, and then during states of eruption to provide information and warnings to both the public and local state and federal authorities. And we have a, a very wonderful website that's listed at the bottom there, which is a database-driven dynamic website um, and has brought the people responsible lots of praise um, because of how it can be used to uh, disseminate information during times of crisis. I sort of started to mention uh, not all volcanoes that are potentially active in Alaska are monitored by instruments. In fact, less than half have ground instrumentation on them. And there's, there's a bunch of reasons behind this. One is the sheer logistics of it. Um, I don't know if anyone here has been to the Aleutians, but uh, if you look out the window today and the, the windy, rainy weather that you see, this would be considered a nice day in the Aleutians. It's not a fun place to work logistically. You're, you're, it's not easy to work. It, the Aleutian Islands cover about 2,500 miles. And so the limitations brought by that, the limitations brought by um, our budget mean that we can't instrument every volcano we'd like to. Also, you know, even with ground instruments, they don't tell us everything. Uh, up the top there, you can see a video playing on Augustine Island uh, showing some of the eruptive events that happened last year. And I'm showing this because it highlights a couple of features, which is one that, namely, webcams are great, and, and, and it's good confirmation that something starts. But uh, pretty soon after it starts, you don't get to see too much as the ash comes down. So how do we go about you know, solving this problem? Well, we use remote sensing. And remote sensing has a, a couple of advantages. One, it can provide this, this synoptic view of the area. Satellite images can cover everywhere we want to look at. And so we can use this for providing confirmation of eruptions and also for tracking certain features. And we'll be looking at those aspects in a second. Uh, we also, within the remote sensing group, are not entirely limited to satellite data. Uh, if you look back here, the image at the bottom here and this thing here are, are the FLIR camera, which is a, a thermal infrared camera that we ha own a couple of at the Volcano Observatory and have used on many volcanoes. But the core of what we do is the satellite remote sensing. And we have our own receiving stations up in Fairbanks. What you're looking at here is uh, actually two of our buildings. And the Geophysical Institute is the, is the sort of the brownish one with the big SAR dish there. And this is the Arctic Research Building. I work in a building behind this. Um, but up the top here, we can, we can see the various antennas that we have up there. And there are three main satellite data sources that we deal with. One is AVHRR, which is on the NOAA weather satellites. We're effectively misusing weather data is what it comes down to. But these satellites collect data in wavelengths that are very useful to us for looking at volcanic features. We also have a MODIS antenna, which is the big white golf ball there. Um, that 
is very similar to AVHR, although is not as useful because the we basically because we don't get as many passes per day. It's of a similar resolution to AVHR. Both have about a kilometer pixel resolution. Um, what makes AVHR so useful to us is it's a polar orbit orbiting satellite, and there are several of them up there, less in recent months since they've started crashing them intentionally, but still we get somewhere between 20 and 30 passes a day. We have a supplemental feed that comes in from a NOAA station that sort of backs up the images we receive. And then in addition to this, we, we get a data stream of GOES data from the uh, Naval Research Laboratory in Monterey Bay. Now, this isn't quite as good. The resolution is about four kilometers per pixel in, at our latitudes. Uh, but that's offset by the fact that we get an image every half hour, so better temporal resolution. And that's good for tracking some features. Uh, down in the left here, you can see our sort of makeshift monitoring that we have. It's, uh, well, we mostly all just sort of monitor at our own desks. This is there for show and for visiting people. But it, but it does, does uh, give you a, an idea of some of the things that we use. And, and in fact, we're going to zoom in and look at some of those tools. So we get these data streams coming in. And basically, the first thing we do in processing is we divide them up into different sectors. This makes the data more manageable for us. And we have 10 defined sectors, uh, six across Alaska, two across Kamchatka, one in the Cascades, and not shown here is Yellowstone, which is right at the edge of our station mask. And the way we look at this data is we actually use a proprietary uh, Linux-based uh, system which processes the data and then provides a visualization tool. And quite frankly, I hate it. It's horrible. It never works for me. And it's frustrated people enough that in the last couple of years, we've started to create what we've called web tools, which are web-based applications built and uh, designed by us that allow us to do our monitoring in a, a friendlier, more, or more user-friendly environment. Advantages of this are pretty obvious. You know, if something happens, say it's two o'clock in the morning, we get a phone call, we can just roll out of bed, open our laptop, and, and see what's going on. And so we have these tools, and I guess the, the, the best place to start with these tools is our, what we call our data center. And what we're showing here is a list of the images we have available within our our data streams, AVHR, MODIS, and GOES. Actually, you're not seeing any MODIS right now because the, the antenna's broke, but that's OK. We, we've got plenty of good data coming in with AVHR and GOES. Uh, there's also some other features that we're going to discuss in a second here, but this, uh, this database one here is telling me that someone is logged into the, the database monitoring system. And what this is, is a My, MySQL database, PHP front end, into which we enter our observations. We do this twice a day under normal conditions, uh, more frequently sometimes, or at least we look at the data more frequently during times of eruption. And this provides a way of succinctly making observations and then outputting them into a uh, automatic reporting system, emails and such like, that can sort of rapidly disseminate that information to the people that need to know. So what is this information? I'm, I'm talking in generalities. What is this information that we, we put into this database? Well, there are two main features that we, we're seeking to find when we're looking at our satellite data. And the first one is what we call thermal anomalies. Who can spot the thermal anomaly? It's right here. And so actually, if we zoom in, it's, it's kind of obvious that if we look at this image here, there is a, an area of white that sort of stands out from the background. Um, now, we don't just look at the images like this. I mean, that would be silly. There, there are tools here where we can overlay coastline and 
and do um, adjustment of the contrast and actually uh, make these things stand out a lot better. I just I spend a lot of time looking at these type of images so I can spot them immediately. But what I mean by a thermal anomaly is some pixels of elevated brightness temperature relative to the surrounding area. Of what relevance are these? Well, it could be of a lot of relevance, could be of no relevance. There, there are many reasons behind or that, that can cause a thermal anomaly. One of the most frustrating reasons is they could be uh, noise pixels. That happens relatively frequently, although usually with a cursory glance, you can dismiss these. Where they get more interesting is when they are located near or close to the summit of a volcano that either we know is maybe having some unrest from the seismic instruments or has a history of unrest or is even in eruption. Uh, this plot here is actually the temperatures at the, uh, the summit of Augustine volcano uh, plotted for, I think this is, yeah, for the start of 2006 when it was actually heading into a, a period of eruption. And so if you can look back here in early January, we've got low temperatures and then suddenly it goes up and it stays up and there's, there's some up and down. It may just look like a bunch of points and, and lines, but this is actually very meaningful to us in terms of activity going on at the volcano. But a context that maybe makes more sense to you is to look at it in this way getting back to the pictures, or actually technically getting back to a table graphic form. This is one of our web tools that we've developed, and uh, it's sort of the brainchild of John Dean and, and has been put into action by Ray and Lovro. And uh, we refer to this as the 40 by 40 viewer. Reason for this is this area here represents a 40 by 40 cutout of our imagery. Uh, 40, uh, 40 pixels by 40 pixels. And we choose that because the geospatial location of features in AVHR data isn't that good. In fact, we only have a certainty that it's, it's correct within plus or minus 20 kilometers. Hence, we have to use a 40 by 40 cutout. And through this online system here, we, we take that image and actually turn it into a, a, tabula, a table where each of these pixels represents uh, effectively a color, 0 to 255. And it sort of regenerates the image, but allows more than just showing us the image. I mean, it's obvious here that there, there's something anomalous here. But down here, we have these interactive buttons that compress that, that, that highlight features on the image. And it does this through an algorithm that's running in the background called the Okmok algorithm, which takes these data in and assesses a whole bunch of parameters and tries to identify what it thinks are genuine thermal anomalies. And in this case, Okmok comes up and says it's a genuine thermal anomaly. And you know, I can tell you that is, that is correct. We can see, uh, or I can look at the metadata on the side here and see that, OK, the sun zenith angle is over 100, which means it's a nighttime image. And the, uh, it's a nice uh, small satellite zenith angle. So, so this is a nice image. We're looking at Mount St. Helens. I know there's an active dome growing there, so it's no surprise to see a hotspot. You'll also notice down here at the bottom, there is an option to output to KML. And I'll give an example of that later. And but at this point, I should mention, and that is the sort of the next stage that we're going with our web tools right now, is to automatically be able to dump them to KML and display these things in the context of Earth, which adds a whole other element to what we can see. The algorithm that runs also generates automatic alarms according to certain protocols. We have email alarms and under certain circumstances, SMS messages that come in. So there is no escape. We do get woken up in the middle of the night, quite often by noise pixels. But we're working on that. 
So that, that's hotspots. Now, the other thing we're looking for in our imagery is ash, ash clouds. I sort of went into the reasons earlier why we worry about this. It's a huge aircraft hazard. And we can spot these things in our data sets. The method we most commonly use is something called the split window technique. And what this is, this is a brightness differencing technique between two bands in the 10 to 12 micron range. And because the silicates at these different wavelengths have different emissivities, we end up with, uh, with this difference that can be highlighted through subtracting the, the data sets. And we also have a tool similar to the 40 by 40 viewer that can be used to, to look at these. Um, this is, there's nothing going on in this image uh, other than to show you that this isn't an infallible technique. There are a number of limitations on it, um, not least of which is weather. If either the, the ash cloud is covered by high cloud or there's generally just bad weather in the region, the uh, weather, moisture in, in weather clouds will have a similar effect to the silicates. And so we can, you know, we can end up with these strong 4 minus 5 which is the, what we refer to the split window technique for AVHR because it's band four and minus band five. We end up with strong four minus five signals just due to weather. Uh, also, this technique doesn't work close to the volcano because it requires a translucent plume. Obviously, if the plume is too dispersed, it doesn't work either. This uh, particular web tool we're looking at here, we refer to as the image flipper. It's a, uh, here we are actually using the real images. It's basically a fancy FTP server where we have the ability to go back and forth between images and pause and animate them in various ways and even combine different data sets. And again, we work off the sector system. And down here is the output to KML. One of the useful extensions of this technique that uh, William Ross has, uh, has been doing lately is to actually combine a series of split window images into what we call an ash composite. The image we're looking at here is a whole bunch of images, I think for about two months worth of AVHR data combined together to show you where the ash was concentrated from the Augustine 2006 eruption. And we could see there was a pretty healthy dispersion. This is the Cook Inlet area here. Anchorage is up here. So it just about got up there. But mainly the, the real ash concentrations were concentrated in this area sort of across the Kodiak Island and on the peninsula here. Uh, we'll actually show more about Augustine in a, later on in the talk. And the ash composites, too, have an uh, output to KML option in them. Now, given these limitations with the, the ash detection techniques, we need to have a backup plan. And the backup plan is if you can't directly see it, model it. And so several years ago at the University of Alaska, they developed an ash dispersion modeling program called PUF. Now, PUF is basically a model that takes a set number of particles and a Wind, vectorized wind field data, places the particles at a given volcano and releases them. And then based on the wind field data, tracks where these particles will go, both lat, long, and altitude. And as the work on PUP has developed over the year, it, it's obvious that it's very important to have tools like this in combination with our other techniques. Um, the eruption of Cleveland in 2001 was a great example of this, where down in the left here, we have one of these, these composite ash images, actually in this case from GOES, which showed, that, yeah, we had, we had a nice 4 minus 5 split window signal coming across the Alaska mainland here, but we weren't seeing anything down across the ocean. That's because we didn't meet that criteria of having the right contrast of backgrounds 
to to the uh, ash cloud. And so we never actually saw a cloud that according to Puff should, and as far as we know from pilot reports, did exist. And so you know, this emphasizes the importance of having something like this to, to double up on our assertions of exactly what's going on with the eruption. Peter Webley is the person that's been doing all the work on Puff recently, and this is one of the things he put together, where it's a Puff composite, where he has taken the data for every eruption in the North Pacific over the last 30 years, and I should qualify that slightly, every eruption that has put ash to over 20,000 feet in the last 30 years. The reason 20,000 feet is important is because that's when we start to get into aircraft flight routes. So that's when we really start to worry about the effects of this. And you can see some patterns of activity here. This big cluster is Kamchatka where that's where all the fun happens. Volcanoes are just going off there all the time. But there's also a healthy amount of activity across Alaska and from St. Helens. And you can see these, these wonderful looped around patterns that some of the ash clouds have taken. Uh, I, I think it was the spur eruption you can see actually put ash all the way across to the eastern seaboard of Canada. So we make all these observations and we put them into our, our wonderful database. And from that database, we can automatically generate reports. Um, as you'll see, this, this is sort of plain looking because it hasn't undergone the same uh, pixelization process that some of our other tools have. But if at this point we go into a live version of this, we can see that this is actually an interactive table of sorts in the the week's observations are, automatic, uh, are generated by the database into this table format. The volcanoes that are color coded are all listed here. What I mean by color coded is there's uh, raised level activity, and so they, um, they, there's a well. There's two systems now by which they define the level of alert at a volcano, and so right now. There is mostly stuff going on in Russia. And if we access oh, wrong one. If we access one of these things, we can actually draw up information from the database. Now, the one I'm choosing is Okmok volcano. Now this is interesting because as you saw there, Okmok is technically at green. There's in theory nothing going on there. But I do know Okmok volcano has erupted in the relatively recent past. In fact, this whole tool was developed in 1996 and ended up being called the Okmok algorithm, the, the algorithm that runs behind it, because it, it, was first, uh, it was first used to identify precursory activity at Okmok in 1997. So we have this tool and we can adjust the contrasts. And it seems like, yeah, maybe there is a genuine hotspot here. At least it's very faint. So we can turn on these assessments. Doesn't seem to be any solar, that makes sense. We're a nighttime image. Not really any cloud around. And Ogmok isn't picking it up. It appears to be too sensitive, but I'm still suspicious. So let's try outputting it to KML. And hopefully this will work. There we go. So if we give that a second to figure out where it is and where it's going. There we go. <coughs> and it will fly us in. And this is where we, we find the real strength of Google Earth, or where we find it's, it's useful to us. 
we can take this, we can generate our KML, we can overlay it, and at this point, we can start to see where this potential anomaly is relative to the surrounding area. Now, I've never been to Okmok. I don't know it too well. I know it's a caldera system, has a number of uh, vents. I'm not sure if where we're seeing the anomaly right now is where the last activity occurred. But from Google Earth, I am learning a couple of things. I'm seeing that there's a, there's a dark water body there. And OK, it doesn't exactly locate over there. But if you remember the uh, geospatial location errors in AVHR, maybe that could be the cause of it. Or maybe the cause of it is, the, uh, is something happening at one of the vents. So my approach at this point is to go into the wonderful Smithsonian volcano layer and use that to track down some information about Okmok, about where the last activity occurred. And we can bring that up. I apologize for the slowness. It's my laptop, not the system. So. And if we go to eruptive history, let's see what it says. It says, area of activity was down Kone, which is in the southwest part of the coral there. So that maybe at this point makes me less suspicious that something's going on, but maybe not. We'll definitely be keeping an eye on this. Um, but what this shows is, is, is by combining the, the visualization that Google Earth gives us with our tools, we, we can sort of learn a lot more than we would have had just staring at our plain old image. And so this is the approach we've taken using Earth. And, and so we, we've tried to develop tools that can integrate with it in a useful manner. If we fly to a, an example that should be familiar to most, take a second. Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is always a, a good one to show because it's, it's got the wonderful DEM there that really allows you to get in and see different aspects about the volcano. Uh, what we can see here is the big horseshoe amphitheater that was created by the eruption. And here is the, the new dome that is growing. And this is something that regularly shows up in our data as a thermal anomaly, and in fact, one of the things we've done is visualize a whole year's worth of anomalies and plotted them in their locations and tried to define the causes behind these different anomalies. Now, at St. Helens, I pretty much know they're all genuine. The scatter that you see here is a, is a consequence of that, that poor geospatial location that goes on with AVHRR. And I can say that with pretty much full certainty, because I know that there is this hot lava, lava dome on there. And if I actually go in excuse me, and look at, the, look at the, the facts and figures on my different hotspots, I can see that we have a pretty bright anomaly there, about 17 degrees relative to about minus two background. It's a nighttime image, so it's not like this is a solar effect or some other false anomaly that's occurring. And if we zoom out, we can see how this, these anomalies look for a, a year's worth of data across the Pacific region. This right now is just a static data set I put together. One of the things we're working on is, is automatically generating these and to have a way of through our, through our database system, tagging what we think are the various causes of the anomalies. Some other uses we put the interface to. Uh, well, I was going to show this. I was, I was hoping to show you a great comparison between what Mount St. Helen looks, look, looks like in their brand new uh, high definition webcam and the imagery. Unfortunately, that is the view for the high-definition webcam. There's a lot of snow up there right now. So instead, 
Let's go to Augustine Volcano. As I mentioned, this volcano erupted last year and was really a, a great impetus to us in terms of pushing the development of these various tools on. One of the things that we almost immediately used Google Earth for during the Augustine crisis was the creation of overlays that showed the, the ash signal. And here I can just show sort of three in the row, which if we flick through quickly, kind of shows you what's going on there. Now, obviously, we could do that a bit slicker by using the, the uh, time function. And that is something that we have done. Right now, we can output from our various image flippers and have the overlays. We can't output a series of them, but we're working to develop that. But we have used the time function for some data sets at a different volcano, which is Mount Cleveland. Mount Cleveland is a volcano that seems to have a habit of eruption, erupting five or six times a year right now. They're relatively small eruptions. Uh, an image that some of you may have seen is this right here. This is a picture that was taken from the International Space Station by one of the astronauts up there. And they actually spotted this before we did. And they called down to the operations center in Anchorage and said, hey, have you guys got a volcano erupting? And between describing the landscape and sort of, I believe, looking at maps and maybe in Google Earth, they figured out exactly which volcano they were talking about. So this was an eruption in, I think, May of last year. And a visualization that we'd previously created was for a similar style eruption, which we do have modeled. Try and get a good angle. So what we have right here is one of these plumes modeled. Um, but we actually created this about 18 months ago. So this isn't a Collada model. This is, in fact, a bunch of translucent polygons stuck together. And in fact, right now, we're using the time primitive to animate it. But when we created this, the time primitive hadn't been released. But we were still animating it. And the way we did that is we actually had a back-end server that allowed us to refresh the content. And so we, we were using, that was one of our previous claims to fame that doesn't sound so good now. Now time is native to Google Earth. But we could use time in Google Earth about six months before it came out. And the data that provided the information for these polygons, we got out of the PUFF model. And so at this point, we go back. There are a couple of puff visualizations that sort of that are the next stages on. That was our, our first attempt at using puff for visualization in Google Earth. And we, we rapidly came to the conclusion that that just wasn't going to work, making tens of thousands of polygons was going to get messy. So instead, we switched to place markers. And as I say, this, this is Peter Webley's work. This was sort of originally what we, we used for our, the visualization, the ash, what we call bubble puff. It's effective. It, it shows you how the plume came out of Augustine, how we got this great kink on it, the, the differences at the different elevations. But this is what we do now. And, and this is now starting to look more like a real volcanic plume. Through using some tricks in terms of the type of icons we're using, it, we've made it a lot prettier. And what Peter does is he generates automatically uh, three hours of puff data in KML form for volcanoes of interest. Uh, you'll see on the list here, we're not just actually including Alaskan volcanoes. He has a contacts around the world of people that have asked him to create these files for their volcanoes. So 
So before we end here, I want to show you something that combines all of these sort of techniques that I've briefly demonstrated together into a useful format. This was a video I put together for a conference this summer. And the idea here was to try and show how Google Earth can be used to tell an instructive story in a format that is sort of user friendly to, you know, be it other scientists or the general public. And I apologize that the, the DVI version of this doesn't seem to output to the screen. So, oh sorry, the AVI version. So once it comes up, we're gonna play this for YouTube. We'll get there. So just as a brief background, Augustine Volcano is a volcano about 350 miles from Anchorage in the Cook Inlet. It's actually a small island onto itself. Uh, the, I, I believe the lease of the island is actually held by the university. Um, it has a, a fairly rich history of erupting over the last century. All right, so here we go. So we basically summarized one year of activity in about a minute and a half there, but hopefully it gave you a brief overview of the sort of things that we can do using this tool. And so that's pretty much what I had to say today. Uh, Many of these data sets we do have online on this site up here, uh, but rather than giving you the URL of that, um, what I'm going to do is, is just announce that I'll be uh, combining my various data uh, projects and things that I work on in regards to KML and Google Earth into one easy to remember URL. And just to show and prove that I do live pretty much at the end of the world. Thank you.
So the question was, if I could add one thing to Google Earth to make my life easier, what would it be? Well, that's an interesting question, and I guess my answer has actually changed in recent months. One of, one of the things that was high on my wish list uh, until recently was the ability to add videos and sort of rich content into balloons. Um, that, of course, has now been done. Um, we, have, we have a lot of great images and videos and things internal to the Volcano Observatory, which, which could really benefit from being displayed in that format or be at least being made accessible in that format. So I think right now, um, if I'm specifically talking about Google Earth as opposed to KML, my, my main wish would to be able to do more in terms of how you combine different files together. And what I mean by that is for that video, we had to effectively record little snippets and stitch them all together. What I'd like to be able to do is everything you saw there in some sort of scriptable form uh, along a related format, I guess the ability to structure your files on the, the left-hand sidebar would be nicer. Um, you know, those two things may sound apart, but not necessarily. I mean, if you, if you think about how the Tor function works right now, it goes through a list of files. So, so for me personally, though, those would be two things that would really advance what I could do with the, uh, with the tools that we have right now and the tools that we are developing. Have I played with the 3D mouse? Yes, I have. And I actually forgot to bring mine today. But um, we actually, you may be familiar, we, we just ran a session last week at AGU where we highlighted the use of virtual globes and in, in, in the earth sciences. And obviously, Google Earth and the use thereof were, was highly featured. And, uh, and one of our speakers who came was, was from 3D Connexion. And um, she sort of showed people that maybe hadn't been introduced to the mouths, you know, what it could do. Um, she also passed around an example mouse that someone made off with at the end of the talk, which I just thought was wrong, but I don't know. I guess some people, exactly, so. What, what cooperation do you have with the Russian government on the Kamchatka? Uh, that... Well, sorry, the question was, what cooperation do we have with the Russian government in regards to Kamchatka? I guess the short answer to that is, it depends how they're feeling that day. Um, the truth is that there is a great bunch of people that work at KVIRT, which is the uh, Kamchatkan Volcanology, I forget what it stands for, but basically their volcano observatory, who are chronically underfunded and you know, they do a great job given the resources they have. We have people that officially liaise with them and therefore through them with the Russian authorities. Our primary interest in, in, the, Russian, in the Russian volcanoes, Kamchatka volcanoes, is not so much what goes on on the ground. We, we do have various research projects that various members of the observatory are involved in. But from our perspective, it's what comes out of their volcanoes because the general tendency of the winds in that region is to blow to the east. So pretty much anything that comes out of their volcanoes ends up over Alaska, and it's our problem. So there, there's a lot of communication that goes on between us, between CAVA, between the, the weather service who is char in, you know, it's, there's sort of the, the rough definition of between who's in charge in terms of monitoring and tracking is that when the volcano is in states of unrest and, and the plume is still attached to it, that's our turf. As soon as it's a separate cloud, that's when the weather service likes to take over. But we don't all act individually. There's a lot of talking and cooperation that goes on. There, there could be more, and we're working on that. But you know, I guess you could argue to date we've done a good job because no accidents have happened. Is our life easier in winter in, uh, in regards to seeing hotspots? Well, I, I thought you were just asking the first half of that question. 
I believe is about 20 minus, um, minus 20 at home right now. So um, yes is the short answer. Um, much easier because of the thermal contrasts, um, because there's more darkness. You know, the inverse of that in the summer is we have very little darkness and it's a nightmare. Solar reflection everywhere. Uh, there are a few caveats to that in winter, uh, one of which is that geothermal lakes or even just, you know, naturally heated lakes can start showing up as fake, well, as anomalous ev events. Um, and so we have to be aware of those features. And as I said, there's, you know, over 100 volcanoes in the area we're looking at. Hence the utility of overlaying these things in Google Earth and flying in and actually looking at the landscape, because it might be that we see a potential thermal anomaly, a volcano we've never viewed. But if we view in and uh, in Google Earth, we can see, oh, there's a big lake there. That explains the thermal anomaly. Not 100%, but most likely that is the cause. You're using two thermal bands for looking at the ash clouds? Yes, we, um, in the question is, are we using more bands to actually fill up the Well, for the thermal anomalies, we're looking at the, uh, Basically, what, what is channel? Sorry, the question was: um, We're using two thermal bands to look at ash clouds and anomalies. Maybe, and if we use more bands, would it help us weed out the the false alerts? Uh, for the ash clouds, we use bands in the ten to twelve micron range, and the the key thing there is that the the uh, at those different wavelengths, the emissivities of the silicates show up differently. Um, so when under the right circumstances, that technique is very good. Where that technique falls down is where the plume is not translucent and or it's too dispersed or there's bad weather covering it. You know, that's just... At that point, we need to maybe move to the visible bands and things to try and identify plumes. We also don't just rely on, you know, colored pixels. We also look at morphologies because ash plumes have a more distinctive morphology than, than most weather clouds. In terms of the thermal anomalies, our, our areas of interest there are into the, the three to five micron range, or what is in the AVHRR channel three. Now, one of the reasons that, and the reason for that is that's where hot stuff, hot lava, shows up. Now, for the AVHR data, that can be frustrating because they, on a couple of the NOAA satellites, they actually built a 3A and a 3B sensors. And what that means for us is for some of the passes, we don't actually get any Channel 3 data because they, uh, they set, I believe they set different gains and they were targeted towards daytime observations. So we, we effectively miss out on a whole suite of data that could be useful. In terms of weeding out the, uh, the fake events, that is hard to do. We, the algorithm that I, I mentioned that runs things behind the scenes, uh, through looking at a year's worth of data, it's about 70% accurate. You're never going to be able to eliminate all noise from the, the, sig uh, from the signal. And, so, and a noise really accounts for about 20% of the inaccuracy. So there, there are very few other events that are sort of fake anomalies that we, we can kick out. We, we could raise our thresholds, but we, we, we have to trade that off. Uh, we have to trade off raising the threshold to being certain that we catch all the genuine volcanic events. And, and there are some things that, that are genuine anomalies that, that we, but we're not interested in. For example, forest fires. We see them, and in some circumstances, if a forest fire is on a volcanic slope, it may look like a genuine thermal anomaly. I think so. we're kind of, I don't know if this is on. I think we're kind of running out of time, so if anybody has more questions for John, please come up afterwards. Uh, we're also looking for 20% volunteers. If anybody wanted to help uh, any kind of potential collaborations here. One more time, thank you.